I'm Charlie Albone and welcome to episode 8 of season 2 of That's How We Grow in partnership with Still Garden Power Tools. Garden design is a true passion of mine, a passion I turned into work and I'm lucky enough to have built a career in. Seeing your first garden design be built, grow and evolve over time is an amazing feeling. Getting to repeat this over and over is an absolute joy. I always try to consider the location, the architecture and local conditions when doing a design, as the garden needs to fit the area. Learning what works and helping the garden evolve with that over time helps support a lasting and thriving garden space. Once built and established, the maintenance of a garden is vitally important. From weeding and pruning, to cleanups and replanting, it all needs to be done to help keep the garden looking grand and deliver on the original design. I doubt there are any more highly credentialed garden designers in Australia than Paul Bangay. Paul has designed gardens across the world and with his garden stone fields in Victoria, it's an incredible demonstration of his passion. I can't wait to chat with Paul about design philosophies, how his team maintains stone fields and watching the garden evolve with time. So let's grab our sketchbook, marking paint and plant some ideas. It's time to start chatting all things garden design with Paul. My guest today is an icon in Australian garden design. His passion for classical and timeless design has turned him into a worldwide success. He has shaped so many designers by inspiring them with his amazing understanding of proportion, sense of place and plant knowledge. In 2018, he was awarded an OAM for services to landscape architecture. I am, of course, talking about Paul Bangay. Paul, welcome to That's How We Grow. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, Paul, where did it all start for you? How did you get into gardening and, and landscape design? You know, I listened to so many podcasts of sort of uh, garden designers, interior designers, architects, and they nearly always say the same thing. It comes from childhood and, mm. a, and, and a great childhood love of gardens. And my mother was a great gardener. You know, we, 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 we had a normal quarter acre a block in the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne, but mm -hmm. it was a very leafy area and um, she was very passionate about her garden. So um, from a very early age, I was out in the garden. She gave us our own little patch in the garden and I just, I just adored gardens from a very, very early age. Do you remember uh, what it was that first sparked your interest? Because I remember mine was a, like a fritillaria bulb, seeing that pop up in grass that really took my imagination and I ran with it. But do you, did well, you see, have a moment it, like that? Well, so you you were lucky. You, you grew up in that lovely sort of mild uh, gardening climate of England. I grew up in the sort of harsher heat of Australian summers. Um, mm. Mine, I, I guess mine, we used to go for holidays. We had a little holiday place down near Polar Bay in the Otways. And we used to go to this wonderful fern gully and um, I became obsessed with ferns and I just used to walk through this gully and think, I just want my own little fernery. And my father built me a little shade house that I was able to grow ferns in. I put a pond in there and was just became obsessed with ferns from a, from a very early age as well. So I guess, wow. I guess walking through those wonderful uh, rainforests of the, of the Otways was my sort of moment. Yeah, right. Uh, so how did that turn into landscape design as a, as a career? Um, so my father was Pro Vice Chancellor of RMIT, one of the biggest unis mm -hmm. in Melbourne, and he's like, I knew from that very early age that I wanted to do gardening my whole entire life, and he's like, well, you have to go um, do a course to do this. And I'm thinking, why Why does anyone have to do a course? <laughs> anyway, he, um, he, he took me to Burnley, which I think was probably and still is one of the best places for, for a garden designer to, to, to learn th their craft. And um, so I worked to, towards going towards getting into Burnley. I did the, the subjects necessary. I did the work experience necessary and, uh, and, and then went to Burnley. And that was probably, you know, those four years of Burnley were just magical for me and, and right. taught me so much about garden design. Do you remember the first garden you ever designed? First garden, I, like I used to do little gardens for my friends and my parents mm -hmm. and uh, they were very... Um, they were very sort of willing to to help me out, and you know, probably at the age of like fourteen or fifteen, I was creating like little areas for um, pockets of gardens within uh, gardens of my of my families, fr friends of my family. Sorry, mm -hmm. and um, so there was a pond and a little flower border I did for for a friend that lived about you know a, a kilometre away from our house, and 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 funny enough, I'm doing a book at the moment on an archive of all my designs. Right. And and I found that photograph of that one, that garden we did, and it was hilarious. It was this terrible <laughs> pond that I built, and <laughs> full of annual plants and everything we don't use these days. But yes. it was a very special moment in my life. 
Yeah, I remember one of the first gardens I designed was for my mum. Uh, you know, I was looking for some work. She's like, just come build a garden for me. And we kind of made it up on the fly. And there was also a terrible water feature in there that I just couldn't get level. And it was, you know, you saw lots of pond liner and it was just horrendous. But, you know, really sparked an interest for me. It was a great it was a great moment of awakening, realising that water needed to be level when I built that pond. I didn't think yes. about it up until then. Yeah, and my mum was like, no, the bottom has to be level. I was like, no, no, <laughs> mum, the top has to be level. Yes. I remember arguing about it, yeah. Uh, so where do you get your inspiration from for your, your garden designs? Um, look, I think travel, definitely travel for me it is. Like I mm-hmm. love travelling around the world and I loved going to very interesting places in terms of um, garden design. So I've been to Syria, I've been to Iran, I've been to Jordan, you know, I've been all over America, right, right through Europe. Mm. And um, so just travelling, and I try and do that two or three times a year. And when I travel, I go to as many gardens as I possibly can, private gardens, public gardens, botanic gardens. I'm just always obsessing about um, visiting as many gardens as I can. So I think it definitely, for me, the inspiration comes from travel, seeing new planting schemes, you know, g- trying to go to new gardens that new modern garden designers are, are sort of doing mm. and seeing new planting styles I think is very important for me. So how did you cope during the pandemic in lockdown? Did yeah, it was, you... it, it, it was a bit difficult. I mean, luckily... You know, we were at Stonefields. We were locked down in Stonefields. Yeah. And uh, so we had a lot of space and, you know, had this wonderful big garden to work in. But, um, you know, I'm used to travelling all the time. And, you know, almost every week I'm travelling somewhere around Australia and, you know, we couldn't do the international travel. And because we were in Melbourne, we, you know, we were the worst. We were locked down for 230 days. Yes. And so I couldn't get to Sydney. I couldn't get to any of the jobs interstate. Um, so it was, it was a very difficult period for, for, for mm. me particularly. So I guess you would be known for, well, actually, I've noticed your style has changed uh, over your career. You, you I yeah. guess, were first known for a bit of a formal, timeless style, yep. and now you're using a lot more perennial plants and a lot yep. more softness in your planting. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk to us a bit about how it started and how it evolved? So it started, I, I really became um, obsessed with uh, 18th century French gardens when I first started. Like I just thought, I, I went to France, I went to Villandry, I went to Versailles and looked at those gardens and thought how amazing all these shapes and forms and, and the way they sculpt plants was. And so, you know, very early on in my career I was doing pleached hedges in Australia when, when no one was talking about pleached hedges, having trees come out of gravel and um, sort of replicating what I'd seen in, in those, those French gardens. Mm-hmm. Then I sort of moved on, you know, and, and cause, because I've been working for 40 years, I've gone through a few decades, Charlie. So, you know, there's been a few there's been a few style changes. And then I sort of, you know, became more obsessed with English gardens. And then, you know, sort of in the last 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years, I've sort of become very comfortable with my own style and 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 sort of experimenting with what I what I love doing. Mm. And that sort of led me to sort of more organic shapes, softer shapes, more informality. Um Balancing a little bit of formality with a with with, with mostly informality and mm-hmm. becoming obsessed with perennials and, and flowers. And who would have thought when I first started off doing all green gardens that I'd now be doing clashing reds and purples <laughs> and oranges and, and yellows in a flower border. But you do what makes you happy, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So are your clients asking you for a certain style or are you turning up and imposing a style and saying, This is what I see, or are they saying this is what I really want? I think, I mean, when I first started, I think people didn't have much clue when they when it came to the style of the garden they wanted. Mm. And they, and I quite often I'd ask that question, you know, well, what style do you want? And they couldn't really answer that question. I think now um, Australians are really well informed and very educated when it comes to gardens. Mm-hmm. And so I think they seek out the designers that represent the style that they actually want in their garden. So I'm not asking that question so much anymore. And yep. I'm not sort of imposing myself. So people will come to me and, and um, not not necessarily say what style they want because they know that the style I'm going to give them is they've they've done their research and, and matched it well. I mean, I mean the only the only question I might ask someone is like, do you want some formality or how much formality do you want in your garden? You know, versus right. in, informality. But yeah. you know, I think I think people. There's so many great garden designers now, and I think people go to each designer because they know their particular style. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, what are what are your clients asking for? Like, so, I, I hate to ask the question gardening trends because that's something I don't think should really happen in the gardening world because a garden takes so long to mature. But you have to. Have you noticed that your clients are asking for a certain thing? Yeah, I think. I think they're. I think gardens they're really becoming very conscious about sustainability. 
So yeah. quite often they're asking about, you know, um, drought proofing their gardens. Like, you know, let's choose plants that are going to be appropriate to the climate we're living in. I think mm-hmm. that that that's that's a big change that's happening. And productivity. We're seeing a lot of clients wanting more productive parts to their garden. So the vegetable garden, the herb garden, fruit trees, integrating those into the general part of the garden or having a separate big vegetable garden is is like nearly one of the big requests that we get asked all the time now. So I think I think sustainability and productivity are one of the big trends that are happening. Did you now. notice more so after the pandemic people were interested or or was it already ramping that No, way? I think it was I think it started before then. I think climate change has really made people aware of that. And yep. I think organics like people wanting to, you know, know where their food comes from and, and not having so many chemicals in their food. Mm. I, I think that was definitely starting before the pandemic. Um, I think the pandemic definitely helped gardens. Yes. If we can say there's a positive from the pandemic, it really is gardens that have benefited from it. People were stuck in their houses and, you know, they they realised the importance of getting out in the garden, relaxing in the garden and actually gardening. I think, you know, there's two parts to gardens. There's the actual design of the garden but the actual looking after a garden. People yes. have realised how wonderful the act of gardening is. And uh, that was my next question. Are you a keen gardener or are you just a designer? No, no, I'm a keen, I'm a keen gardener. I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've just bought this little house. We bought it four years ago in the UK. And as opposed to Stonefields, which is five acres of garden, um, it's quarter of an acre and I can maintain it myself. And I just love getting out there and gardening. In fact, every day, you know, the English are, are, are crazy. They stay inside their house all the time. In the middle of winter, I'm out there staking plants and gardening and I just love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, my my mum tends to put the garden to bed for winter, as she calls it, and then she, they're all out there in spring. Are you an early morning gardener or are you just an all-day gardener? No, I'm an all-day gardener. I'm an yeah. early morning riser. Like, I like getting up early and yeah. going for a walk, but I, 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 I'm an all-day gardener. I like being out there all day. How do you uh, talk to, to your clients about maintenance? Because obviously, well, a lot of your gardens are quite large. Uh, they have yeah. that sense of formality to them and they take a lot of maintenance. So how do you sort of speak to your clients about how this thing is going to evolve into your vision and, uh, you know, keep going and looking better after time. And I think that's another wonderful trend that's happened in Australia. I think when I first started off and people were very conscious of maintenance and they were very scared of maintenance. You know, a lot of the the biggest request I ever got early on in my career was a low maintenance garden and making Mm. sure that there wasn't, there wasn't too much maintenance associated with the garden. People are not so scared of it anymore. Like I think they're sort of embracing the fact that Gardeners, gardens need to be looked after. You might have to employ people, or you might have to get out there yourself quite a, quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very it's a it's a very hard thing now. Like you know, gardeners are in such short supply. Finding good gardeners is so difficult. I think mm-hmm. that's that that's the big problem with gardens now is is actually finding professionals who can help them and help them yeah. look after them. But um and, and you know I'm finding that people are willing to spend more time themselves in the garden and 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 employ professionals for that. Yeah, so you mentioned Stonefields is of five acres of garden. How many yeah. gardeners? I mean, obviously you couldn't do that all by yourself. You're, you're a very busy man. How yeah. many gardeners do you have helping you look after after? So we have two. We have two gardeners here. Wow, yeah. and they're full time. They're full time. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing because yeah. you've got that your iconic parterre garden. I guess the yes. cu- the cubes in the cylinders. Yes. Uh, how did that come to be? Well, I mean, the garden's twenty years old now. So twenty okay. years ago, you know, formality was still a, a big thing. Yeah. And um, I took the philosophy with this garden because it's, it's set in the most beautiful um, location in central Victoria. And we've got some beautiful big eucalypts, some big 500-year-old eucalypts around mm-hmm. here. And it's very undulating. It sits on the top of this hill. But it's got these wonderful views down the valley and the, and the contours are very soft around it. So I, I took the view that we'll start out very informal on the outside of the garden and then get very formal as we get close to the, to the house. And of mm-hmm. course, the, you know, the the ultimate part of that formality is the parterre, and I just wanted to have a play on, uh, you know, I didn't want that Renaissance sort of feeling to a parterre with all the squirrels and baroque yes. baroque shapes. So I just did the geometry of just cubes and 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 and, and spheres, yeah. And so it's just a play a play on sort of you know ge- geometry as it gets closer to the house. And I've I've battled with that parterre for a long time. I've threatened to take it out and fill it with flowers. And wow. soften the whole thing down. But then I kind of think, well, should you bend to the whim of gardens? Because, you know, in 10 or 15 years' time, we might, we might be back to more formality again. Well, that's it. You, you can't go for trends, can you? You've, you? No. But it is it is quite iconic. And I think if you were to rip it out, it would be such a shame. I mean, you can 
you can always create more gardens elsewhere, can't you? That's right. And at the moment, Charlie, it's just beautiful. It's it's full of white tulips. So we every year, so that negative space between the the box shapes yep. always worried me. I mean, I we 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 put the parterre in. You know, for two or three years, it was it was fairly juvenile and didn't represent much. And then the shapes became very defined. And I looked at it and thought it needs to be a bit more dynamic. And so we filled it with tulips during the mm-hmm. the you know in the autumn. And they're just, we've got like three or 4,000 white tulips flowering in the middle of it now. And it's wow. just, it's just magical. Yeah, so yeah. it would be a shame to lose that. Yes. And how else has the garden evolved over the years? Because obviously you added the tulips to add some interest to the, the parterre, but what else have you done in the in Well, the space? We, I mean, the problem is I've created a monster. So I, just, <laughs> you know, I get bored and I just keep expanding and expanding and expanding it. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we added, the last thing I think we added was this wonderful lilac walk. We, did, we, we planted 100 lilacs. Mm-hmm. And they're just about to burst into 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 flower now, um, and and it and it's really because because with the inner core of the garden is really well done, we're sort of bleeding out into the landscape, and so it's becoming more and more informal as we go out. So right. we're adding you know wonderful things like that very soft meandering lilac walk, um, and adding more uh, perennial beds that are in very organic shapes as they sort of bleed out into the landscape. How do you but, ever get any work done? <laughs> no, it's very well. I'm here now, and I so. You know, my studio, my design studio, I, I work during the week and then come up here on a Friday and do all my design work on a Friday and weekends. Yeah. And, you know, I've got to pass through the garden to get to get to my studio and I, I often get waylaid. So it's, <laughs> I'm sure. It's, it's, quite often the office goes, have you done that plan? And I go, no, I got a little bit no, sidetracked. Sorry. No, no, I haven't, but I've taken a lot of cutting, so it's <laughs> yeah, fine. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's in Dalesford and yeah. the weather there can be quite harsh. How do you sort of assess a site and uh, sort of apply a design to the conditions? Well, I think that's, I mean, that's a really important thing to do. I mean, you know, I work all over Australia and it's very important to listen to what the site's telling you in, ter- in terms of the climate. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think for a long, long time we've tried to impose the wrong planting styles on on, on certain locations. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if there's not much water and it's going to be hot and dry, let's not be planting hydrangeas and azaleas and camellias and all those sort of things. Let's look at a planting style that's appropriate. So... You know, I always go to a new site and quiz the client. Have we got water? You know, what are the summers like? What are the winters like? And mm-hmm. and and tailor the planting scheme to to make sure that it does suit the climate. But at Stonefields, I mean, we've got. I think this is the perfect climate for for gardens. We have cold, wet winters, and we get yep. frosts that kill all the bugs. And we've got beautiful soil up here. And then in summer, we have hot, dry summers. So it's perfect for flowers and and um, perennials and, and all sorts of plants, really, because we've got we've got enough water. We have the lovely cold winters and 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 lovely sort of summer mild nights. Right. Uh, how do you break a client's heart when you can perhaps tell them that I'm sorry, you're just not going to be able to grow that here? Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, I find I don't know whether you find this hydrangeas are the hardest one. So yeah. many people like Instagram has been good in so many ways and bad in other ways. Like so many people yeah. go, I just want this garden. It's a you know it's a garden in the Hamptons in outside New York. Yeah, full of white hydrangeas. Where in for some reason in the Hamptons you can grow hydrangeas in full sun even though they have a hot summer. And I have to go to them, you, you, you just can't grow them here. And they go, yeah. why? That That is the feeling I want. That's the style I want. And I go, well, you're going to get 45-degree days and hot northerly winds and they're yeah. not going to live. They're not going to like it. Yeah. And, the, and it, it, there's a great resistance to that because, you know, they see it on Instagram and think they can have it. Yeah, it's uh, Instagram's a killer for things like that. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. yeah. How much importance do you put into soil preparation when you're um, implementing a design? Well, I think soil is one of the most important things you know you, you should look at when you when it comes to landscape design. We mm-hmm. we do a great specification sheet, and it's really heavy on on the on the on the soil preparation. Yeah. And I think that now um, the world's really paying attention to soil, and I think that's just such a wonderful thing. And yeah. I'm great friends. Have you heard of the land gardeners in yes. in England? Yeah. So Bridget Robinson, who's a New Zealander, is a is a good friend of mine. Okay. And I just I, you know I worship everything they say. If anyone wants to know anything about soils, buy or just do some research from the land gardeners because they they think we can cure climate change through compost, and right. it's just such a wonderful thing because you know making your own compost, putting your own compost into the into into soil actually ties up a lot of carbon in the soil. And, yeah. you know, I think that the you know nothing is going to do well unless you pay attention to the soil. And I think one of the biggest problems we've got in Australia is we think we are a hot and dry climate, which we are, but then no one pays attention to, to um, drainage. Yeah. And then you get these cold, wet periods and all the plants die because they've got wet feet. 
because no one has looked at the drainage of, on, a, on a property. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much that happens uh, from the soil level down that it's yeah. almost, or it is as important as everything that grows above the soil level. That's right. If you get the soil right, the plants will thrive. Yeah. So how do you cope then? You've got a, a cocker spaniel, yes. <laughs> as, as do and I. You've got, I see you've got a uh, cocker spaniel. I've got two cocker spaniels. <laughs> uh, and if, she's, she's just at my feet now, fast yeah, asleep. I've, I've got one on a chair and one, one by my feet. In the <laughs> how do you cope with them in the garden? Does it really oh. frustrate you when they trash things? Or No. Well, see, we, I don't know, we just got blessed. We got the best cocker spaniel in the world. She is, huh. she doesn't get in the garden. I mean, she goes chasing rabbits through some of the plants. But yes. she's very delicate. She's just been the best dog. And we taught her from day one not to wee on the lawns and she just she knows that she goes out to the paddocks and has a wee or goes under the gravel and has a wee. She's yep. just been fantastic with 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 the garden. I think if you have two, yes. it's a bit of an issue because they sort of become a bit of a gang and, and sort of rass about. But just yep. one, they're devoted to you and they just want to be with you the whole time. Yes, well, the, both of them are like that. So they're, they're both lap dogs. They fight for attention and then they go and trash the garden. So, But you've also, so you've got two Cocker Spaniels. Yeah. You've also got the other enemy of gardens is children. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you say that, but my, my youngest son, he's a real gardener. So Is he? Oh, that's he's good. At, I'll find him out in the garden watering and deadheading and, you know, he's mad about bonsais as well. So, you know, he's becoming quite a good, uh, quite a handy one. The other one's very creative. So I'm hoping I can, you know, have one of them as a, in the design team and one of them in the construction team. Yes, hopefully. but do you have to bend to their will and have you got things, such things as playgrounds? No, no, trampolines. No. We, so I've got swings uh, and slides. Uh, we've got uh, where we live in the city. We've got a, a, a pool which keeps them happy. Yeah. But then we've got five acres uh, north of Sydney as well. So yeah. the playground is just open the doors and, and out you go. So, so I mean, you're, so you're, you've obviously done it the right way. I mean, I think you know, we quite often we do a beautiful garden design for for, for the city. Yeah. And it's not a big space. And then they go, oh, we forgot what to tell you one thing. We need a built-in trampoline. Yeah. And I go, well, there goes your lawn or there, <laughs> there goes that lovely yeah. big deep garden bed over there. I found the best thing for kids' play equipment is get them to use their imagination. You know, if yeah. you can have a bit of a woodland walk with some stuff to balance on and, you know, stuff like that, you can make it look nice and and I think that's the way to do well, it. Can you send this message out into the <laughs> into the, into the – <laughs> the wonderful universe because yeah. I, more people need to say that because, you know, that's how I grew up. We grew up in a beautiful garden. We actually, we had we had quite a bit of space and I had a horse and I had goats and yeah. and everything. But, you know, I just come out from school and just play in the garden yeah. or go look after my animals. I didn't, you know, I didn't need all those other activities. And I think that helped my creativity. I'm, I'm sure it did. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Stuff like that really does. You know, your imagination is the best thing you can have, I think. Um, with all the hedges that you you have and have planted, yeah. you you'd be pretty good at uh, pruning a hedge, I would imagine. Uh, um, yes, our <laughs> gardeners are much better at pruning hedges than I am. And whenever yeah. I come out with some equipment, they get very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there a type of maintenance you like doing? Is it in the veggie patch? Is it hedges? Is it weeding? Is it deadheading? What is uh, my it like deadheading, doing? I love deadheading, mm. and I, the veggie patch is my domain. So I love being in the veggie patch. I mean. Yeah. You know, if ever we were to move from Stonefields, God, God help us, I, I, I envisage sort of retirement with just a walled garden, a walled veggie garden and a nice house. That's all I would love, a park with some beautiful trees and a veggie garden because I just adore being in the veggie garden. It's interesting you say that. The more designers I talk to, I find that all of them love vegetable gardening. Yeah. I love vegetable gardening. And I think, I don't know what it comes from. Perhaps it's because as a designer, we create a garden that, you know, keeps going on and on, whereas yeah. a vegetable garden has a start, a middle and a finish, and it's the yeah. harvest, isn't it? I, I know it keeps going, but there's there's something to that, I think. Well, I think it's it's I think it's more rewarding. I mean, you know, it's it's very rewarding walking around a garden, seeing everything come into bloom, watching the seasons happen, but yep. it's far more rewarding, you know, planting that little lettuce. And six weeks later, you've got something you can eat and yes. pick. And and my, my husband's a great cook, so we have the rule that I grow it and he cooks it. And it's just a great partnership that way. So we we both become involved in the in the garden that way, and it's forever changing. Like you know, gardens are quite static. I find mm. in terms of you know you plant them and you tend to leave them like that for ten years or fifteen years. But the veggie garden's changing every, every for every season, and I love that change and I love being able to implement that change. And you can easily try something new as well, which is good. Yeah, and yeah. it doesn't matter if it fails. Yeah. 
Because, <laughs> yeah, oh, I've killed many things. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, easy to do that. It is very easy, but it makes great compost. Um, so do you have a design firm or do you do construction and maintenance as part of your No, we're firm? just we're purely design. So we've got, okay. you know, I bought this wonderful old warehouse in Richmond in Melbourne, mm-hmm. um, and which is just a great building for us and we've got uh, four landscape architects in there and and some and some other team members of the team and mm-hmm. uh, we only do design right so how do you then see the projects through to completion construction but then also guide the maintenance team that's going to be looking after them to implement your vision because obviously they take a long time to fully evolve into in, into what you were thinking exactly. they were going to be so we, we you know I, over the years I've now got great teams of contractors in each city that mm-hmm. I work in within within Australia and New Zealand. I've got some great people in New Zealand. Um, so, you know, I rely on them quite a lot to make sure the gardens are implemented beautifully. We supervise, mm-hmm. so we go back and watch the gardens going in. Yep. Um, maintenance is a very difficult thing, like we were saying before. Finding good maintenance people is difficult. But, you know, we're often visiting gardens, you know, one year, two year, three years, 20 years later, we're often going back and just doing reviews of gardens and making sure that the maintenance is, is done properly. Right. The, the hardest thing I find is when we work, you know, because we work all over the world now, is when you go to some. We went to Austria and did a job, and how do you find good contractors that in a in a country you don't speak the language of? And, yeah, and, and you don't know anything about. So that that's that's always the greatest challenge for me is finding contractors overseas. Limp- and, it. and I guess dealing with a different climate and a different soil type is that yes. quite yeah. difficult. Well, I just I just got back from a new job in Puglia in Italy. Right. And the client wants Sounds this Sounds terrible. It's, yes, no, it does. <laughs> well, uh, the client wanted this beautiful garden. It, it was like 38 degrees. There was no topsoil. It was on rock. There was yeah. just rock everywhere. <laughs> and he's from Los Angeles. He wants this beautiful garden. I'm going, well, we've got no soil and we've got no water. <laughs> yeah. it's just, I don't know what we're going to do about this, but, you know, we'll, we'll find a solution somehow. Do you think a, a good garden has to be large and expensive? Or No, no. We've got, you know, in our, in our little studio, we it, it's this big warehouse. I took off probably the last 10 metres of the upper storey, the roof off it, mm-hmm. and created this little this little courtyard. That courtyard brings us so much joy and the clients so much joy. You know, it's just we did all glass, so it's just we look straight into this courtyard. Yeah. Every client that comes in just goes, wow, this is – it's amazing not in the fact of the design, but it's just so peaceful looking into a garden from a house. So, yeah. no, I don't believe they have to be big to be to be good. So what advice would you give someone who um, is a keen gardener themselves but wants to create a special space for themselves? I, I think the most important thing, and I think this, I think Australians struggle with this, is proportion. Make mm-hmm. sure you get your proportions and scale right. Too many people try and cram too many things into a small space mm-hmm. and make sure the objects you're going to put in there are appropriate size. You know, maybe, maybe if you're looking for something to put in there, just put one big thing in as opposed to a whole lot of small things and cluttering, cluttering. Mm. And I think, you know, just pay attention to scale and proportion. And I think that's, that's the most important lesson you can learn when it comes to gardens. Is there a rule that people could follow to get that right? Or is it more about, I guess, the space that they need to travel around the garden so things don't feel too yeah. big and bump into them? And- well, I think it's very instinctive. And I think that's one of the lucky things that I, that I managed to get in life. But um, I, I think one of the, the only thing I could tell people here is make sure your garden beds are deep enough. I mean, you know, people tend to think oh, it's a small space, so let's make it a narrow bed. Depth to a garden bed and the layering in gardens is probably the most important part of garden design. Creating that depth to planting I think is really important. And the smaller the garden is, the more important that is. So you think uh, in a small garden still get as many plants in as possible? Yeah, Get as many layers in as you can. You know, can, yeah. you, you can trick the eye by by d- sort of merging the boundary away as far as possible or, or disguising it even and then creating shadows within plants in there, you know, creates the illusion of more space. And do you think in a small space it's important to um, introduce lighting so it can be used at, at night as well? Yeah. Is that something you do a lot of? Yeah, we, t- we, we tend to... Um, uh, not do lighting in gar- country gardens. Like I try, like people say, well, let's do lighting. I go, no, the country's all about um, the moon, the light, the, the stars and, and and just natural light. But I think in the city where you're sort of, you know, got a lot of glass and you're looking into a garden, mm-hmm. m- lighting is really invaluable. Like if you can light the garden beautifully so it becomes like almost like another room to the house, I think that's that's well worth doing and we try and do that as much as possible. Yeah. Um, I've spoken about Ruby and you've said that she's a little angel around you. Yeah. How do you deal with Harold the peacock as well? 
much. Well, Harold's <laughs> Harold's a bit of an angel as well. I mean. <laughs> He, we sort of, uh, someone rang us and said, look, we've got a peacock for sale. Would you like one? He was just a chick. I'd never thought of getting a peacock before, but they were just down the road. I thought, yeah, I'll try. And like I said, we we got him. We locked him up for three months, like you got to, and then let him out. And he's just become a great friend now. Like I call him and he comes. Right. Um, they, they're very easy. They don't they don't need feeding if you don't want to feed them. They look after themselves. He roosts up in a big tree and he just comes and goes as, as he wants. He poos everywhere. Like he yeah, loves being near us. So he'll sit at the back door all day or sit on the, the table outside mm-hmm. and poos everywhere. So that's that's the hardest thing about owning a peacock. And then if you've got a male, because you want a male with all the beautiful feathers. Of course you do. They squeal all through the mating season. So right. you've got to make sure you've got a big enough garden, your neighbour's far enough away because he's very noisy. <laughs> but he does make your garden look magnificent, I have to say. And he does. And he doesn't crush anything. And he eats all the little bugs in the garden, I think he... He's a big plus for us in the garden. Yeah, a healthy ecosystem through peacocks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think you know uh, the interior designer, Steve Cordoni. I've yes. been out to his place at Rose yeah. Farm. He's got five albino peacocks there. I know. All named he, Pedro. <laughs> he came here and stayed one time before he, I think he got Rose Rose Farm. Yeah. Um, and um, I think he said he, he wanted some peacock. Some peacocks, and I didn't realise he was going to get five of them. <laughs> I don't know how he comes. One, we, everyone keeps going to us. Well, you know, do you want to get Harold a mate? And I go, no, because that'd be twice as much poo. And yeah. so I don't know how Steve's coping with five times as much. He's also got an ostrich as well. I saw that, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. a camel. <laughs> and a camel and cows and horses and the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. Do you uh, prefer being in the country or in the city? No, definitely in the country. Yeah. Love being in the country. I mean, my dream would be if I could move eventually out of the city and full-time in the country... And just work in the country in the countryside. I'd, I'd be really happy. The reality is, you know, your bread and butter's in the city doing gardens. But you know, if I could just eventually end up doing four or five big country gardens a year, that would be absolute bliss for me. I mean, country is just so much better. It's you know, I got to this stage in my life. I'm 60 next year. That I love peace, and I just love the sound of the countryside. Like you know, listening to the birds and and mm-hmm. and being out here is just so rewarding for me. I'm I'm, I'm finding the cities a little difficult now. You've inspired so many landscape designers through your various books and, and your work. Would you have What advice would you have for a young landscape designer? Um, I always say expose yourself to as many styles as you can and, you know, just travel as much as you can, get as many books as you can, look what everybody else is doing and, and don't, don't be too blinkered. Like, you know, always be open to new ideas and, and new planting schemes. Research as many different varieties of plants as you can. And so I I think, you know, I always say to people, travel, just travel and see gardens, just like live your life through gardens as much as possible. Is that where you get your confidence from? Because obviously um, you, you've built an amazing repertoire of work uh, and you've got a confidence to say, this is how I think it should look. Is that come from experience or from travel, seeing other people succeed in something and going that work there, I can use that there? I think that's just come from, from you know, just been working for so long. I think, you know, when I was, when I first started off, I think I was quite timid and um, was uh, was a little shy and, um, you know, sort of listened to uh, architects too much and interior designers too much. And as, you know, I've become more confident with my style and know that it's the right thing for the site, you know, you develop more confidence. So if you don't start off with confidence, don't worry. It will come because you will build it. As you create gardens and people love them and you know they're successful, you, you will become more and more confident. I think that goes for even just gardening as a gardener. You know, yes. It, confidence yeah. comes comes with just doing it, getting it wrong, getting it right, in seeing what happens. But that's the wonderful thing about gardening. I always say to people, gardening is a process of experimentation. Mm. Don't be afraid to try something new. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't really matter. I mean, that's gardening, you know. It's your garden, you know, failure is failure is all part of the process. Yes. Do you have a favourite garden that you like to visit? Uh, is there one that you yeah. would recommend that people should go and see? If anyone can get to Nympha, have you been to Nympha outside uh, it's Rome? It's on the list. It, it is on the is list. It is just magical. It's probably yeah. one of my favourite gardens in, in, in the world. Nympha is just a magical place. It's an old village that was deserted during, I think, a malaria plague or one of the plagues. Mm. And it's all crumbling down and someone bought it and it's just full of r- rambling roses and wisteria. It's got a chalk stream going through it that's so clear that it's almost a garden in itself. It's got sort of all this wonderful weed growing through the, bo- mm. the bottom of it. It's a, it's very hard to get into. I think it's only open one Sunday a month or something, but 
That's yep. definitely on the list. And Rousham, if you can go to Rousham in England, yep. that is my favourite garden in England. It's a William wow. Kent garden. Um, it's open every day of the year, I think. So if you're ever in England, seek out Rousham. It's near okay. your mum, so you should be going to Rousham. Uh, I'll be going to Rousham, yeah. yeah. I think uh, Nympha was called the most romantic garden in the world, I think. And it definitely is. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a lovely way to finish, uh, enticing people out to get travelling and into the garden. And uh, thank you for inspiring people through all your work and thank you for your time today. Pleasure, Charlie. Good talking to you. You too. Now it is time for our community questions. Okay, so on to the first question from Luke Castelli. Luke's a big fan of the podcast and he lives in the ACT. He just wanted to ask a quick question. Now, in my opinion... Why aren't perennials more popular in Australia? As you know, most are super drought tolerant, thrive in poor soils, endless range of colour and foliage, easy maintenance, fast growing, easy to propagate, shall I continue? It says, every nursery I walk past has an extremely small range and when I walk around suburbs, they're seldom seen in any gardens. Well, I think this is about to change because Australian culture towards gardening is changing. European gardens are more about beautiful gardens, flowers, and Australian gardens have more been about outdoor entertaining. Where do I put the pool? Where do I put the kids' stuff? But now more and pe more people are getting outside. They're really seeing the benefits of flowers and making their space look a bit nicer with something that might take a little bit more maintenance than, say, a philodendron xanadu might. So watch this space. I think you're about to see some more perennials coming to Australian gardens. My next question is from Chris in Melbourne. He says, Hi Charlie, I've, I've had a few plants suffer frostbite this winter, particularly my clivias. The flowers are coming through and they're beautiful, but the partly burnt leaves look horrible. How do I get them back again? Well, you will never get those leaves back again. What happens is the frost freezes the water in the leaves and bursts all the cells. So what you need to do is remove the damaged leaves. I would then give them a slow release fertilizer and a liquid fertilizer, because that's really gonna push on growth and bring back nice fresh green leaves. And in the meantime, well, you can enjoy the flowers. Finally, Katie in Sydney has asked, she thinks it's a great podcast and she loves indoor plants, but some of them are looking a little yellow. My devil's ivy has lost a couple of leaves, as has my fiddle leaf fig. I've given them some liquid fertilizer, but how do I help them out? Now, indoor gardening is incredibly tricky. No plants have evolved to be in a cave, which is where we live, with varying temperatures between air conditioning and heating. So it's really difficult to get plants to thrive indoors. You need to try and replicate some outdoor conditions. So put them as close to the sunlight as you can without being in direct sun and keep the water pretty regular with them. I like to take my plants into the shower once a week. I know that sounds crazy, but it helps wash them off. It helps soak the root ball and it just helps them out a little bit as well. Well, I have absolutely loved answering your gardening questions. And although this is the end of the season, the inbox is staying open. If you'd like me to answer your gardening questions next series, send them to my email, charlie at still.com.au and I'll get to them next time. I feel so lucky to have chatted with Paul today and we learnt so much from him. We learnt to inspire yourself through travel, absorbing cultures, styles and experiences. It was interesting to discuss the evolution of garden design, how sustainability, organic practices and people wanting to maintain their gardens has become more and more popular. And I think most importantly, plant appropriately for your soil and water requirements. Well, thanks for listening to That's How We Grow in partnership with Still Garden Power Tools. Need the tools to take on any garden challenge? Go to the Still website or head to your local Still dealer today. There are over 600 Still dealers across Australia and you can easily find your local dealer through the convenient locator on the Still website. You can find us on Instagram. Follow Still at Still underscore AU and you can follow me on Instagram as well, Charlie underscore Albone. Sadly, this is the final episode of our second season of That's How We Grow. Thank you to everybody who has listened. And if you haven't already, please catch up on our episodes from season one. Don't forget to subscribe and rate the series. A big thank you to all of our guests this season. Again, we've had some amazing gardeners join us and share their knowledge. It's been a pleasure to chat with them and they've all been so generous with their time. Don't forget to check out Still's blog with plenty of great gardening advice, as well as my key seasonal tips and tricks. Be sure to go to blog.still.com.au. I'm Charlie Albone. Thanks for listening and until next time, goodbye.